Good evening, everybody here at Iberum Iconicious Institute. And also, uh, hello to all those who are following us online. My name is Peter Birle. I'm the uh, academic director of Iberum Iconicious Institute. And it's a great pleasure to give you a very warm welcome to this event on a new Silk Road of culture China's cultural policy engagement in Latin America and Africa. This event is uh, co-organized with the Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, IFA in Stuttgart, and uh, German Institute for Global and Area Studies, GIGA from Hamburg. Uh, when IFA asked us some time ago whether we would be interested in co-organizing this event here at EIE, we uh, instantly said yes, that is really important and very, very interesting to have uh, a discussion and uh, to have these studies on China's uh, cultural diplomacy, on Ch China's cultural initiatives in Latin America, because we know a lot about China's economic activities, also about Chinese political interests in, in Latin America. But uh, <clears throat> today there is not very much research on cultural activities. And if one is talking to colleagues in Latin America, then very often um, one can see that there really is not only the economic and the political activity, but there are also a lot of uh, cultural activities. And uh, so I'm very happy to host this uh, activity here today. And uh, this is, in principle, everything I would like to say. Uh, we uh, will have our participants um, then presented by that Hoffman, no, I think. But uh, first, I'm going to hand over to uh, Sebastian Kerber from IFA. So thanks a lot for uh, joining us here at this event. And uh, I'm quite sure that this will be a very interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Birle. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here at the ibero Amerikanisches Institute for today's launch of two IFA studies and the discussion on a new Silk Road of culture, China's cultural policy engagement in Latin America and Africa. And of course, I'm very happy to welcome those joining us online this evening as well. As part of the research, IFA research program, Culture and Foreign Policy, Shimena, Shimena Zapata and Avril Jaffe analyzed the goals, strategic and strategies and instruments of China's foreign cultural policy and its multilateral engagement in Latin America and Africa, respectively. The results of these two studies are published in the IFA edition, Culture and Foreign Policy. These studies are both online and you can download them on our website. That's to say the IFA website. The IFA Institute for International Cultural Relations is one of Germany's intermediary, intermediary so-called intermediary organizations, Mittler Institutionen for international cultural exchange. In addition to art exchange and the support of civil society actors worldwide, we conduct research and provide documentation of central topics of inter in international cultural relations in order to accompany and analyze foreign cultural policy measures and provide impulses for future policy. In light of current geopolitical shifts, for us it is very important to understand the background and measures of international cultural relations, including those that take place within the so-called South-South cooperation and to learn from each other. We are therefore very pleased to discuss the results, the findings of the studies to, to, together today with uh, Dr. Lutz Müller, Deputy Secretary General of the German Commission for UNESCO. He will be online. 
with Professor Hans Maul, researcher at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, German Institute for Foreign International Secretary Affairs, before giving the floor to Professor Bert Hoffmann, head of the Giga Institute Berlin, who will lead us uh, through the discussion today. I would like to thank Avril Joffe, she is online, and Jimena Zapata, very, 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 very I warmly welcome you to uh, you too for the dedication to the research project. I would also like to thank the Ibero Americanisches Institute for the cooperation and for hosting us today, as well as Bert Hoffmann for uh, for facilitating the discussion in this hybrid event. So we look forward to your contributions to the exchange of ideas and wish us all an, an, an inspiring discussion. Thank you very much. A warm welcome also from my side, uh, Bert Hoffmann from the GIGA in Germany, so Global and Area Studies. Um, it's a big pleasure to be here. The topic is too important to have a third prologue to it. We will try to get started as quickly as we can to the studies. Let me just briefly say how the evening is planned. We will have both authors of the studies present their studies, the one on Africa and the one on China's influence in Latin America. And then we will have Professor Hans Maul and Dr. Lutz Möller comment or compliment from their respective perspectives um, on those two studies. And then we will hopefully have a second round among the panelists. And then we will have hopefully a lot of time for questions and answers with the audience, the audience here in the room and the audience worldwide over the screen. So, um, and we should uh, finish here at about 7.30. For those who made it through the German autumn rain, there's a rewarding little reception afterwards. For those who are following us from abroad, they can go to the fridge and get something to drink and start reading these studies if they want. So uh, let me just quickly introduce the four speakers we have tonight. Uh, let me start with Jimena Zapata to my left. Jimena is a research fellow associate at the GIGA, the German Institute for Global Area Studies, and is a PhD scholar at the University of Hamburg. And she has been working on Chinese Latin American relations and the political economy of Chinese Latin American relations a lot. And now with the study, she ventured into the field of cultural diplomacy. The second author of the studies is Avril Joffe, who is joining us not from South Africa, as you would assume, but from India tonight. Um, she is postgraduate coordinator of the Department of Cultural Policy and Management at the Witt School of Arts at the University of the Witwaters Rand in Johannesburg, South Africa. She's an economic uh, sociologist and she's working at the intersection of academia and practical work and practice in such fields as culture and urban urbanism and sustainable development. Thank you very much for joining us from afar. And then we have here with us Professor Hans Maul, who is, well, 50 years ago, he did his PhD on the Middle East conflict and we probably could spend a whole evening of finding uh, parallels and differences to that study. We will not do so. We will concentrate on what uh, he has worked on uh, in the following decades, also in Asia and the international relations and foreign policy. That was the chair he held for many years at the University of Trier in Germany. And with again, without mentioning all any of the publications or other uh, steps in an impressive curriculum vitae, uh, just to the final uh, uh, step perhaps is that he is now still working as an adjunct professor at the Bologna Center of the SAIS uh, School of Advanced International Studies of the Johns Hopkins University in Bologna, Italy. And last but not least, we have with us also uh, via screen, Dr. Lutz Möller. He is Deputy Secretary General of the German Commission 
for UNESCO. I think UNESCO doesn't need an introduction. Everybody knows UNESCO, but uh, he's the so he's the kind of the central interface or this institution between UNESCO, the German government, and German civil society academia, and it is based in Bonn. He works for the commission since two two thousand and four, and since. 2015 in his current post with additional specific responsibility for the policy division, education, science, and culture. So we have uh, two great scholars who did an amazing job in elaborating those studies. I can hold them up here. Well, that is very misleading. These are just the executive summaries. It's really a very, very substantial study in both cases, almost 200 pages each and so uh, you can be excited about what they have to tell us in very limited time uh, condensed so with that i would just hand over the floor to the first speaker which is jimena zapata the floor and the screen is yours thank you And good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, making this event possible. I'm very glad to be here and present some key ideas of this whole study that I made on China's cultural diplomacy uh, with a specific focus on Latin America. So I will start uh, right away with the first argument. Um, so one of the broadest arguments that I make in my research is that uh, even though China repeatedly uh, asserts that it is not seeking for hegemony, that it has not an intention to seek for hegemony, regardless of the state of development uh, that it reaches, I do see that the goals in the realm of cultural uh, diplomacy in the field of, of cultural exchanges are carefully crafted towards gaining consensual uh, hegemony which uh, by consensual hegemony, I mean taking the lead of the system of states in China's desired direction and putting in place a, a renewed institutional architecture to replace the, 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 the old uh, world order. And in this sense, culture is key because cultural exchanges are needed for the diffusion of values, norms, ideas, and the new solutions that the new hegemon in this in this case maybe China uh, uh, will will offer no so in this sense there are three main objectives related to China's cultural diplomacy um, related no to this broad objective of gaining uh, consensual hegemony uh, for instance no presenting a positive image show the Chinese version of the of the story and offer alternatives to uh, the Western model of development and, and governance. Uh, now focusing on the specific case of Latin America, um, we have to say that China's cultural diplomacy in Latin America has a long trajectory. Uh, it goes back to, to China's very foundation. Uh, there are three three phases, but in this very last in this very last phase, we see that, or I argue that um, only since the creation of the China CELAC Forum uh, in 2014, uh, there has been a renewed interest by China to elevate the importance of culture. Uh, in its relations with Latin America and link this cultural dimension to the accomplishment of broad strategic objectives, including gaining consensus, gaining uh, support for the Belt and Road Initiative, no, it, the flagship uh, initiative of, of, of China. Uh, it's important to mention that that Latin America does not hold an immediate regional significance for 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 China. No, in 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 the framework in the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative, I would say that Latin America is the last wheel <laughs> of the car. However, we have to consider that Latin America is uh, Latin America's alignment with the global South and the regional proximity of Latin America 
towards the United States renders the region an important player no? in, in China's pursuit of, of this consensual hegemony and in this framework of hegemonic transition that we're living uh, uh, right now. Um, now, I did a whole systematization on, on the initiatives uh, in this uh, China CELAC, CELAC Forum uh, actors, and I could see that um, China's, um, that the cultural exchanges, the cultural initiatives uh, in this forum uh, are part of these areas, no? like education, uh, arts, uh, sports, uh, media, and we have at least three kinds of formats. No? So we have here like this uh, fixed uh, subform uh, uh, spaces. Then we have like other other initiatives, medium to long term to long term projects. The ones, for example, in the realm of of education, which involves uh, scholarships, for example, or or uh, educational exchanges. And then an, another uh, type of cultural uh, initiatives, which uh, are not part of the formal structure of the of the China CELAC Forum, but take um, place on a regular basis. No, we have this sharing the beauty exhibition that takes place every every year, for instance. No? Then um, now like trying to, in this aim of trying to interpret how China's cultural diplomacy navigates from the multilateral to the regional sphere, I do see that China's objectives uh, in Latin America are related to these previous objectives that we already saw no, in the multilateral area. These objectives are related to, for instance, projecting a favorable image, conveying uh, political stand views, understanding the region and presenting alternatives. Uh, I will relate quickly to 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 this first objective, no? Project, pro, projecting a favorable image. So, um, in this sense, China in, in Latin America wants to project this image of China being or, or in the past a peripheral country that has that has a shared development uh, trajectory that it has it has gone from a peripheral status to to the status that it has it has right now no? So even if there are if there are sub um, sub forums related to culture, all these topics regarding how China achieved uh, this status or how China uh, eradicated poverty, uh, what is China's experience in, in local development or industrial development, all these topics we also we also uh, find you know, in the discussions in the in all these these sub forums that we already saw so uh, before. And and of course uh, there are many sub forums in the in the in the in the China Select in the China Select Forum where where new initiatives are presented. Now the latest one is this GDI initiative, this Global Development Initiative, which is like China's uh, China's proposal actually in the in the UN that was back in 2021, 20, 20, and that it is. Uh, presenting no to 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 in the Latin American context, trying to gain like consensus or or support on on this on this initiative. And uh, just my uh, how how many minutes do I do I have? Okay, good. Then um, just my last point, I would say that uh, while it is possible for us to talk about uh, China's cultural diplomacy in, in Latin America, we cannot say the reverse, no? Latin American countries have not agreed, like even on like fundamental uh, principles, objectives, or guidelines uh, for their engagement with, with China and not even like policies or strategies in the specific field of, of culture. No? So I do think from a Latin American perspective that it is important no, that the CELAC uh, determines these, these, these parameters of action because this could facilitate a more uh, balanced point of, of, of departure no? in the definition and the implementation of all the uh, initiatives. No? 
So the China CELAC Forum is uh, almost 10, 10 years old. <laughs> And uh, we, I, I see that it becomes uh, it, it becomes evident that achieving this desired level of intensity in the cultural exchanges uh, remains a significant challenge. No, uh, uh, all these cultural initiatives are made possible through arrangements at the very high levels. No, so one recommendation would be to to decentralize to decentralize all these initiatives i don't see actually like much involvement of uh, the civil society in determining in in the planning in the strategic planning of what messages uh, do latin american countries want want to convey uh, uh, and so i would end up with this point and thank you very much two minutes This already would give quite a few things to discuss, but we will do so together with the next study by Evro Joffe on China's institutionalized cultural presence in Africa. Evro, the online floor is yours. Welcome everybody, and thank you for allowing me to join in from India. Um, so um, it's uh, talk about in uh, seven minutes, but let me just say that in the study and in understanding China's involvement in cultural, in an institutionalized cultural presence on the continent, it came about through the work that I've been doing on the continent for the last 10 or so years and realizing that um, it was no longer just a side of trade and investment and infrastructure development, but was itself a, a very focused, a, a parallel development that had a lot of strategy attached to it. Um, China's in, involvement across the continent is vast, so I chose to look at only five countries, there are lots of networks and also research capacity, um, and I use those as proxies for trying to understand not only why China is increasing its cultural presence in the way that it is focused initially, what do people feel about it? And what are Africans saying about this presence on the continent? Um, written about uh, cultural interest from China at the moment. I think that's going to change already in the last week. I've seen new articles appear about media involvement. Um, but the, the idea that, that struck me was China's initially building theatres on the continent, gifts to African countries, um, and also to thank African countries that had supported them or had shown support to government during times of crisis, such as, such as a Tiananmen Square disaster that happened. And my key argument is that we really need to have a very nuanced understanding of China's engagement on the continent. It is not a binary, it's fantastic, it's exactly what Africans want. And it's not, um, and it, and on, on the other hand, it's not all doom and gloom, and this is a, a, a real disaster. So this this um, attempt to have a non-binary understanding is to really to say that African countries, and I include IT activists, we need to remain alert to what these investments mean. Do they achieve the outcomes they are made to the cultural and creative sector on the continent, as they say they do, um, through uh, through technical expertise or some grants, or are they crowding out local cultural expressions? Um, are they providing cultural infrastructure that is appropriate to the landscape and the environment of African countries? And we see a really mixed response to this um, and a mix set not only of responses but of facts. Over time, China's involvement has, has altered. China is very of the criticism that comes out of African countries, especially from journalists, watchdogs, civil society, journalists, and so on, and are constantly having to recalibrate 
how they um, do what they do. And so some of these concerns and opinions and perceptions surrounding the engagement was really where I first began looking at how artists view it, how they, how they present the media or in um, uh, uh, in uh, operas and plays and, 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 and the like, or in writing. And I began the study and then I realized I had to keep going backwards and backwards to understand where it all happened. Um, and and how how did we get to where we are? And clearly, we have to always begin with the Asia Bandung conference in 1955, which was a key moment in China-Africa relations, where it was established the five principles governing the development of relations with Arab and African countries at the time, um, the eight principles of economic aid and technical assistance um, as a basis for all future engagements. And this has re re sort of resulted years later as China being the largest trading partner for Africa and with the Belt and Road Initiative now 10 years old, is seen as usually sectors development because of the fact that it focuses on infrastructure, poverty alleviation, improved trade and connectivity, all of which African countries need ascribe to. So it's uh, had a long diplomatic uh, relations with, with African countries. In fact, it has formal ties with 53 countries, Eswatini is the exception. Um, and it goes far beyond as an economic markets for trade. It includes security and soft power with increasing interest in cultural relations, but also in cultural infrastructure development, in education, in investments increasingly now in media and film, and much of that latter really comes out since citizens. There is also a very important agency established to support this work called FOCAC, the China-Africa Cooperation Forum, viewed as, as a very strong partnership. However, there's a lot of recognition African Union that Africa needs to really make this partnership work for its own benefit. And we also see since the late 1990s, a little increase in what we call culture building, which is an attempt to enhance the image of China as it has to start responding to the coming out of um, journalists and civil society and artists and, and even governments. Um, we also know that at the point in the late 1990s that China starts showing a very keen interest in culture and creative industries themselves. And so it's not surprising that they start looking at this in, in, in from a worldwide perspective. Um, so there's very little agreement, though. This is a neutral interest um, part of um, uh, parallel development to road and infrastructure development, whether the, it needs to be viewed with skepticism and concern. That's really what the heart of the paper is trying to establish. It's a very strong policy that governs the way China in, it interacts with Africa. The, in 2006, there was a policy paper called um, the, the African Policy Paper, and this was updated in 2021, which is now called China and Africa in the New Era, a partnership of equals, where it really goes far beyond just the, the normal commentary that China gives about sincerity, friendship, equality, mutual benefit, reciprocity, and so on. And it's really focusing now on culture, Africa, cultural relations, mutual support, and shared a shared future. In fact, it uses a term Ubuntu, which is a very long South African term about what it means to be reflective in one another. And you are nobody if not through a mirror of how you are treated by the other. So um one of the things that I looked at um well a number of things of theaters which started many, many moons ago, and so on. And um, we see the first results in Ghana, the National Theatre. Um, <clears throat> but then we also see many other theatres being built, often now with a lot more tension, relationship to the landscape, like the one in Abidjan, beautiful theatre that faces the, the, um, the river <laughs> with a, a, a soft, roof where there's airflow and so on. 
Um, but what we're seeing now is an increased interest in the urban landscape and an involvement in the urban landscape with many architects caught saying that the entire urban landscape of Africa can be started to be seen as one big Chinese investment, whether it's through, but more importantly, through buildings and financeries and structures, um, residential complexes and skyscrapers. I then move on to looking at how China is starting to invest in media and film and music. And this really starts in the 2000s. And some of this media involvement is quite significant. They are investing in um, set-top boxes to help countries achieve their digital migration of the book, which many countries hadn't. And that comes with loading the set of many, many, sometimes thousands of channels from China, um, very few from the local environment, or um, it includes, includes increased development and production, content, content um, distribution, infrastructure development, and investment in, in film and media. And we see that throughout all the countries that I've spoken about. Um, it's interesting as well the range of Confucius Institutes that have been uh, that have grown up on on the continent. Um, we have many many institutes, um, something like um, sixty one of uh, and uh, some of these institutes have been seen as comp as 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 worthy of commentary. So, for example, Wits University, which is my university, chose not to have a Confucius Institute on its premises, arguing that a neutral educational body, it was a direct investment of art from a, from a, a foreign affair um, of, 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 of a foreign um, um, country. It was not um, the kinds of institute you needed on, on a campus. Um, not the case on many other universities. We have six Confucius Institutes in, in South Africa alone. Um, so every development is coming with criticism, is coming with some form of articulation of, do we need this? Do we want this? Is this in our best interest? How do we think about it? And I think that's really what the message of my paper is is to question how we possibly develop a more equitable relationship with China. It does not crowd out local cultural production, uh, local actors, and get make sure that the voice of local actors is involved in those decisions. Often those decisions are made are already uh, on in in the respective countries, already building roads and build and dams and so on, and have spare capacity and therefore offer to build uh, infrastructure, which is sorely needed on the continent. There's, there's, there's no doubt of that. And the question is, when those decisions are made, who should be in the helping to make those decisions? Okay, Avery, um, can you come to we also see conclusions, many, perhaps? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, Point I'll come to conclusions, no problem. Perfect. So, so really, um, one, of, one of the things I'd like to emphasize is that um, the artists are really using their art and their creativity to express the perception of the role that China is playing and to question what it means and to say, to recognize that governments have very different views on the, on the role that China is playing and to ask, uh, and China in response is showing a degree of sensitivity to the negative criticism from the artists and sometimes engaging in that criticism. So in conclusion, um, the key question is, is there any recognition of the danger that local content, cultural content could be crowded out, uh, especially when the appetite of African governments for financial resources is large, where local funds for cultural expressions are in terrible short supply, and when sustainable systems of culture are in place, including when civil society participation is often weak. Thank you very much. I hope you read the paper. <laughs> Thank you very much, Avril. Um, 
I think due to bandwidth problems, we didn't have the video quite as sharp as we would have wanted to, but the audio was perfectly fine. So everybody, I think, could follow perfectly well. Um, okay, without further ado, uh, I pass on to Professor Maul. You've been working on international relations for five, six decades. Um, so what is different now in the Chinese case? Do we speak of the same thing of when we speak of cultural diplomacy uh, for China as we do for European or US countries? And perhaps what has struck you most when reading the, the uh, studies? Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for having me on this panel. Uh, that really gave me a great opportunity to read two very, very interesting uh, studies. And I really want to congratulate uh, each of us uh, on the work they've done. Very instructive, uh, very useful. Now, um, when the uh, organizers contacted me for this panel, I told them, look, I don't understand anything about uh, Latin America and I don't, anything about, I don't understand anything about Africa. So my uh, background for this is uh, the work I've done in recent years, and that work has been essentially on the evolution of the international order and China's place in this. My most recent publication co-authored with two colleagues from SWP was on the US-China relationship. So I think it is important for this uh, panel, for our discussions here, and also for the two studies to have the broader background in mind of how uh, cultural diplomacy in Latin America and Africa fits into the broader picture of China's foreign policy, and indeed in a what I see as a very um, serious and uh, important struggle for the future of international order, which is going on at the moment. And this struggle is about the very shape of the international order for the future. It's also about how much international order we are going to see at all. And this is a contest in which the two most important players are the United States and China. They're not the only ones, but the two are the most important ones. And it's, in my view, a contest about principles, norms, and values as much as it is a contest about power and influence. It's both. Uh, and uh, so if I try to describe the essence of this contest in the most objective way I can find, I have, of course, a position, but I'm trying to be an analyst here. I would say it's really ultimately between a struggle where at the center you have the notion of individual dignity. And on the other hand, you have a notion of the collective well-being. Uh, and the two principles are then associated with the Western liberal model, with all its flaws and its practical implications, but that is at the core is this notion of individual dignity. And the other case, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you have the notion of collective well-being at the center. And we see in all those four countries which I've mentioned, that one of the implications of that frequently seems to be one man rule. And in China now, we have a system which is to an amazing degree controlled by one person, by one man, Xi Jinping. Uh, China has a grand strategy, and the grand strategy is very carefully thought out, and it's very carefully integrated. Not everything works according to plan. Not everything works according to strategy. China is also very good at readjusting and learning, but it does have a very cohesive overall strategy. And the ultimate purpose of this strategy is to make the world safe for the exercise of total control by the Chinese Communist Party in China itself. So it's about buttressing the CCP legitimacy through the realization of the Chinese dream and the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which is to be achieved by 2049. There's even a deadline, a precise date for this. And I think one of the implications is a a striving by China, and that's what the grand strategy also is about, about regional dominance in East Asia and ultimately about global dominance. Now, the implementation of this strategy by China relies first and foremost on building up national power. And that is seen in a very comprehensive way in China. It's about military power, it's about economic power, it's about technological power, it's about soft power, it's about cultural power as well. Soft power, has been considered very important by China for a long time. And soft power is about shaping discourses uh, uh, 
occupying concepts, you know, multilateralism with Chinese characteristics and exercising influence through the way people think and talk. And the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is a very important element. Indeed, you can see that as a grand strategy in its own right. And as we have heard, there's also now a cultural Belt and Road Initiative. There is a cyber Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there is a, a health Belt and Road Initiative. There are all kinds of concepts which are brought under this roof, but they're all integrated, at least uh, in the thinking and in the implementation of the strategy by the Chinese Communist Party. And we have a, a number of other important recent initiatives. There's a global security initiative. There's a global development initiative. There's a global civilization initiative. Now, all this ultimately is about controlling discourses, controlling narratives. So if I were to summarize China's strategy in one word, it's control, control. It, this is those people uh, in charge of the People's Republic of China, China are control freaks, if you like. Now, uh, looking at the two studies, uh, I want to identify a few common themes here, which struck me. Um, and one common theme is the asymmetries in the interaction between China, and Latin America, China, and Africa. So uh, China says this is a partnership of equals, but clearly it's not a partnership of equals. There is a great deal of asymmetry in the interactions. And one of the reasons for this asymmetry, and this is something which is very familiar from a European perspective, is there's a lack of cohesion and coherence in Latin America and in Africa in responding to this framework. Ideally, you would like to see the African Union, uh, Union as the interlocutor or Latin American countries getting together and sort of talking and interacting with China. Uh, this lack of cohesion and coherence is something which struck me as one of the diagnoses of the authors and something which we know, of course, from Europe also already also. And then uh, I think there is also a common theme of the deficiency of participation of civil society in those China, uh, Latin American, China, African uh, interactions. And a last common theme which I detected, uh, and then I'll come to my conclusion, is uh, both uh, the Latin American approach and the African approach of China, and elsewhere the same thing, it's very elite focused. It's basically, basically trying to interact with elites and governments and not necessarily in the first place with people. So let me end by a, a two very specific comments which struck me, one uh, comment on Avril uh, Joff's paper. Uh, at one point, uh, she talks about uh, the desirability to maintain vibrant two-way dynamic, reflect and adjust strategies. Uh, from the modus operandi of China, reflecting and adjusting strategies is possible. That makes sense, as long as it follows Chinese interests and the interests of the Communist Party. But to maintain vibrant two-way dynamic, this is against the notion of control, which China pursues, I think. And for Ximena Tabata, what struck me was the sentence, decentralized cultural initiatives allowing for more direct involvement of civil society organizations while minimizing the excessive involvement of governments. This would be very desirable in my view, but it's again against the modus operandi of the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. Unfortunately, there is no civil society left in China anymore, which is independent from the control of the Communist Party. And it ends with that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Maul. I think the, the asymmetry you alluded to makes it all the more important to look at the discursive and cultural constructions of these relations. Um, but without uh, uh, any further comment from my side, I pass on to Dr. Lutz Möller. Um, you've been working for at UNESCO for many, many years, and UNESCO, of course, is a multilateral uh, institution. And so you've seen Chinese engagement in such a forum life in action firsthand. So from your perspective, what would be your comments on the presentations we have just heard and the studies you have read from the authors? 
Well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you. Uh, thanks a lot to Mr. Pata and Mrs. Joff for their excellent work. I would like to share with you three observations. First, on the two studies itself, mainly focusing on Mr. Pata's studies and the ro uh, role that the PRC takes on in UNESCO. Second, my own observations on that role. And finally, I will comment on multilateralism more generally. And of course, I will not be as wide and uh, thorough um, comments as Mr. Maul has just done. Let me start uh, with a few comments on Mr. Pata's study because she attributes a full section to UNESCO and the PRC's role there. She, you mentioned the World Heritage Convention, the Convention on Intangible, Intangible Cultural Heritage and the Silk Roads Project. I think the Silk Roads Project is pretty obvious. It's well connected and unsurprisingly connected to the, to the BRI. That doesn't need further explanation. But um, the two other convention, um, the World Heritage and Tangible Cultural Heritage Convention, you make some very comprehensive observations. And indeed, you see already in this context that China indeed is becoming much more assertive in cultural diplomacy, also in the form of UNESCO. Yes, China has by far the highest number of inscriptions on the lists uh, of intangible heritage and the second highest number on the World Heritage List. And what is interesting now that in both lists, transnational inscriptions are the exceptions for so far. And there is only one transnational World Heritage site and two intangible cultural ele elements. And that can be approached from very different angles. Mr. Pada, you quote the scientist Professor Wang, and I will quote that now. Two contrasting views have emerged, a monumental approach with a focus on the imperial power of ancient China and an assemblage approach that regards the Silk Roads as a collection of various civilizations. In other words, you can look at these transnational nominations as a multilateral peace project or more as an, an unilateral project. And I think this is an interesting thing to discuss here and to go further down here. I can't judge that. I, have, we, I haven't seen any concrete research on what the history of these concrete nominations would be, but that would be certainly an interesting piece of research to follow up on that. I would also like to quote another sentence from Mr. S Mrs. Zapata's report, where you say that China has also worked domestically towards building a new sense of a multi-ethnic Chinese identity and a unifying and state-dominated nationalism when using these UNESCO inscriptions. And that also, of course, is an interesting quote. And I would like to know from you further later on whether you put the accent here really on the better multi-ethnic understanding of China or the aspect of cultural unification through these UNESCO inscriptions. Let me come to my own um, observations as regards the engagement of China and UNESCO beyond heritage. Um, interestingly, UNESCO, uh, China doesn't have so many UNESCO staff members. Only 17 staff members are called geographical posts. China doesn't have uh, a lot of non-geographical posts, uh, not so many consultants and service, con service contracts, probably some nationally paid offices, but the statistics on that is rather uh, difficult to obtain. And that's why certainly uh, um, China was the largest contributor to the regular budget of, of UNESCO, but that is not a very surprising aspect either because that follows general overarching UN United Nations rules and voluntary contributions of China have not been very high in recent years e either, roughly 3 million US dollars in 2021 and 9 million in 2022. And for comparison in both years, Sweden has provided more than six times the amount of China. That means that the two most important classical levers that country usually use to influence a UN organization, nationals in the staff plus voluntary tightly earmarked contributions, are not exceedingly used by China. This having said, China indeed does exert growing influence upon UNESCO. At least the United States have perceived that the uh, situation as a major influence, and the US Congress officially stated growing Chinese influence on UNESCO policymaking as a reason for their return this summer. And this influence seen by the US at least, notably in standard setting for artificial intelligence, technology, education, and education more generally. And I will not state all that, all the details that China funds two major UNESCO education prizes, the Confucius Prize for Literacy and the Prize for Girls and Women's Education. The latter has been awarded by the president of uh, the wife of President Xi, Peng Liuyang, 
just a few weeks ago in Beijing and the UNESCO Director General met the President Xi for a repeated time there in Beijing. China provides a considerable number of fellowships through UNESCO, 75 actually annually for um, students from developing countries to attend Chinese universities and teacher training institutions. But what is maybe most interesting is the way that China engages with UNESCO on standard setting in the area of artificial intelligence and more specifically in the role of artificial intelligence in education. There has been an international forum on AI and education for five years now. And that so that this topic is actually almost associated with China now in the context of UNESCO. In the, the UNESCO General Conference 2021, China at the last moment tried to change the language in a UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI, which had actually been negotiated for two years. And at the forthcoming General Conference next month, uh, the creation of a new UNESCO Institute on STEM education will be discussed that China promises to fund with almost 10 million US dollars annually. This, it, these are really maybe the most important examples how uh, China uses uh, its influence on UNESCO very strategically and does so increasingly over the last couple of years. I would like to close with my third short point on, on the observations um, of, of multilateral uh, more generally. Mr. Pata, in your report, you repeatedly used the terminology institutional architecture of the liberal order or Western liberal order. And also repeatedly you enumerate UNESCO in a list with the BRI, with BRICS and regional fora such as FOCAC. Only once in your footnote on page 22, you remarked the large institutional differences between the United Nations and such uh, unilateral initiatives such as the BRI. Now, I think we should, should be a little bit more careful here in, for example, using quotations marks or being a little bit more careful in differentiation, because after all, the United Nations are universal, counting among their members liberal democracies and illiberal regimes, according to the one country, one vote rule. And uh, indeed, I have the, made the experience over the last two decades, and even I've read the history of the organization that UNESCO is not really dominated by the liberal West. That was not true in the early 1980s when the United States and the United Kingdom left UNESCO because of the what they perceived as an anti-liberal media policies at the time. And when the United States had to return in the early 2000s at their first general conference, they were actually in isolated member states to lobby against and vote against the adoption of a new culture convention. In 2011, when the UNESCO member states voted for Palestine as a new uh, member state, even though the United States had made it, made it very clear that it would stop paying its contributions, they voted in favor of Palestine and actually did. So there is, this is a forum where all types of countries really negotiate their interests and their values and come to a conclusion. And therefore I would really also try to ensure that we, we um, speak about the United Nations forum in a way that is really respectful of their universal character. And with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Müller. And we are quite advanced in our time already. I would uh, give a short uh, moment for response to both uh, authors of the study, first Avril and then uh, Jimena, and then I would pass on to Q&A questions from the audience here and online. Um, and questions then can be to all four panelists, of course. Uh, Avril, would you, would you want to uh, say a few words on the comments we have heard? from Dr. Müller or from Dr. Professor Maul or any other thought you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for that. I'm afraid I got chucked out of the Zoom meetings. I lost connection exactly when the panelists were all speaking and um, I apologize for that profusely to hear what you all said and I would like to respond as well. Um, I just want to underscore um, what one uh, a couple of points, which is that um, I think it's really, uh, just, just the last couple, a few comments, that 
some of what we are noticing with China's involvement in Africa is not really significantly different to anything that has preceded that in terms of Western colonialism. Um, I think what we are seeing, however, is an accelerated and um, focused attempt to not only repeat and develop the same kinds of inroads that already former colonial powers have on the continent, but change the narrative or at least attempt to change a narrative that says China is doing things differently to the West. Now, I think that's precisely where the commentary comes from, from the perceptions of the involved into recognizing that while the narrative suggests that it, it's different to what the West has always done in terms of um, uh, uh, seeing it as a pretty condescending sort of look at Africa to say, you know, we're going to governance and we're going to focus on your getting free and fair elections. They're saying, well, we're actually going to give you roads because that's what you really need. Um, I think nobody is, nobody's got the wool pulled over their eyes <laughs> about what that really means. And these are different forms of, of um, attempting to, as we say, win friends and influence people. And I think it's very clear is not only um, natural access to natural resources such as oil and gas, but it's also facilitating a, a restructuring of China's own labor intensive economy. And it's also um, finding Africa's support for Beijing's One China policy, which is a requirement for receiving aid and investment as well, which provides political legitimacy for China, and also talking, taking on the role of securing stability in the region, which could, which could in fact mitigate security-related threats to China. So with that said, I think is not um, because that's not my field of work is looking at the general relationship of China and, and Africa, but it's really looking at China's cultural engagements on the continent and how this institutionalized, what does that mean for culture on the continent? And that's really where we need to focus our attention in terms of how to improve and give voice to civil society to add weight to watchdogs and civil society agencies and journalists to be able to do their work with freedom of expression and with um, a great sense that they are heard. One of the journalists that I interviewed, and I think I represented that in working for Star Times in Kenya, meant that he was not allowed to comment on anything to do with state capture in some years or any kind of unfree elections because the message would always come back from, from the principals in China, do not comment on the domestic affairs of our friends and neighbours on the continent. Now, we know that what we understand from Western democracy and freedom of expression of critical values and and um that, people, that countries in Africa hold dear as well. And it's about a new narrative that talks about what do we actually mean by soft power and cultural diplomacy. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avro. Um, Jimena? Okay. So uh, first, I will start with uh, with the questions regarding the issue of asymmetry and the involvement of the of the civil society. Yeah, of course, there is a huge asymmetry between uh, China and uh, Latin American countries, and this happens also uh, with other regions, no, uh, the European Union uh, also. Uh, so I don't see like any particularity no? uh, in, in in terms of uh, China and, and Latin America's uh, cultural diplomacy. Uh, China and the EU both I uh, I think would like to have you no know, this cohesive uh, regional organization that responds uh, to certain specific principles values, but that is not the case. And China has realized you no know, this, and uh, this is why I think that. Uh, China has adopted a very flexible approach. Uh, China's cultural diplomacy operates at various levels. No, uh, in my study, I I talked about this uh, regional level. No, but 
if things don't work out well in this level, then China has other strategies to approach to uh, at the bilateral level, no? So, uh, and this I didn't investigate in 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 in, in my research. I uh, I I I delved into this 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 regional this regional level, no? But I see that China's uh, China has a very flexible flexible approach in this regard, and it has understood that in in the near future uh, there won't be a common voice. Uh, from 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 Latin America, uh, in terms of the involvement of the civil society, I do want to emphasize here that, at least, uh, like I, I analyzed the Latin American actors involved in the cultural initiatives, like who participates in this in this sub for in this sub forums, like who who participates, for example, in this uh, forum of the dialogue of civilizations, for example, and we see. Uh, different, different uh, kind of or kinds of organizations, starting from the ECLAC, for example, the uh, United Nations Economic uh, Commission for for Latin America, to uh, journalists, uh, uh, civil society, Latin American uh, civil society, uh, artists. No, so there is a whole range of actors. Uh, my point here is that. Uh, I don't see much involvement in the definition of the of the cultural uh, of the cultural plans in the in the China CELAC forum. No, China has understood also uh, also this that that uh, now China's cultural diplomacy it's perceived as a one way street. China has understood this. Uh, uh, I argue, and this is why one of the strategies of China is trying to. Um, make um, arrangements with key regional uh, strategic uh, actors. I already mentioned the, the, the CLAC, for example, but we also have, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, FLAXO, CLACSO, like all these encompassing, en encompassing uh, regional organizations that have a lot of like legitimacy no? in, the, in the Latin American uh, regional, uh, regional context. And lately we see that many of the initiatives of these sub-forums are actually organized by these kinds of actors and certain actors, for instance, uh, I would mention uh, in uh, mainly from Argentina, no? Like uh, University of, of of Buenos Aires, some Latin, some some uh, some academics or uh, scholars from from Mexico, from Brazil, who are getting involved in the organization of the events, and also I uh, I also see another um, uh, difference in the fact that okay, many of these of these initiatives were taking place in in China, no, in in, in Chinese cities, no. Uh, now, now, now I see that this uh, that this is changing. Many of the initiatives are taking place in Latin American uh, cities. No. Um, okay. Uh, now, now I will. Yeah, I will try to answer the questions regarding the UNESCO. Yeah, in my study, uh, I deal with uh, China's cultural diplomacy at this at this level, no, in the level at the institutional level, well, like with uh, UNESCO Belt and Road uh, uh, Initiative and the and the and the BRICS. Uh, UNESCO has a long uh, trajectory, of course, and China, I see that is trying to to implement two kinds of strategies, like engaging and shaping. So engaging, you have uh, like uh, al uh, already already mentioned, no? Like uh, one way of engaging is, uh, yeah. <laughs> it it can sound uh, simple, but contributing, no, to the to the budget of the of the UNESCO. But this is particularly important in a time when the uh, when the United States withdrew, no, from the from from the UNESCO, while China was like contributing. Uh, with a lot of money to the to to the budget and, and now nowadays uh, if i'm not mistaken since 2019 china is the one of the one of it is the main contributor uh, of unesco's budget uh, 
more, more than the, I think the second one is is, is Germany. Okay, but uh, my point is it is engaging like financially in many of the in many of the programs. And another strategy that that China uh, is using is uh, yeah shaping. You no, know? and of particular importance is this silk silk and road and 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 road. Uh, uh, program. Just one comment uh, regarding this um, this race that I perceive and that I mentioned in my study uh, about like having many many like mm, heritage sites and cultural elements. No, in the in the in the UNESCO in the UNESCO uh, list. Uh, I get I I I do believe that this has. Uh, been for the benefit of 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 China actually because many European uh, countries are actually interested in knowing the experience of China like how did China went through all these institutional processes to uh, have so many uh, historical sites and historical elements uh, uh, inscripted no in the in the in the in the UNESCO no so. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interest. It's interesting to see like uh, that other actors are are like aware of, let's say, like China's success in this in this in this realm, are and are interested in knowing like uh, the, 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 this experience. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jimena. Um, I, I think we've seen that there's some rhetoric tropes in diplomacy that sound similar, like when China speaks of a partnership of equals. I mean, if you are Costa Rica or Gabon, uh, it's very difficult to see yourself as equal if you're negotiating with China. But even if you're Brazil or Nigeria, uh, that probably is a rhetoric trope that doesn't uh, no one believes to to live up to. But we've also seen that there's a very profound difference in the way uh, the the or the outreach, the cultural diplomatic outreach, is framed in the sense that um, for. Europe and United States, it was towards Latin America and to a different degree to, to Africa. Kind of we are the West, it's a common roots, common language, common religion, uh, migration patterns and, and the like. Whereas China doesn't say we are the West, but China says we are the South. We, we have come from a similar path and we've seen that in both presentations, how that is being uh, played out. And I think that makes really uh, for a big, big, uh, change in if we look at the competition between if it is a competition um, between the western model or the chinese influence um where uh, uh, professor mal said this at the core of the west is this individual dignity that for people in latin america or africa always uh, is easily uh, may sound hollow if you think of the colonial and racist experience of slavery and and colonialism. So China has the big advantage of not having this historic past, of having, not having been a colonial power in both those regions with all the legacy that comes from that. Okay, uh, perhaps that just a little bridge of mine to open the floor to your questions here in the audience and also online. Please, it can go to all four panelists. Don't be shy. If not, we have to continue talking from the panel, and we don't want to do that. We have not four experts in the room, but 30 and many more in the online audience. Please go ahead. And it doesn't have to be questions, it can always be comments, but try to be a bit concise. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting presentations. Alexander Sitenko, I'm independent political analyst working on uh, global war, the global peace and security war, in particular on relations between Russia and, and global south. And my question is on about impact that cultural diplomacy has had so far, Chinese cultural diplomacy in Latin America. Yeah, I, I read some of, of it in, yeah, in the summary on Africa. There are also concerns with regard to rising Chinese power. But what has it brought in, in practical terms? I mean, how is being perceived um in has it helped 
to uh, to 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 un, uh, intensify uh, foreign policy relations between China and Latin America? Or how is China being perceived? Are there uh, more people that are eager to learn Chinese in Latin American countries? What is is are the numbers of academic exchange rising? So is there more interest, and what does it bring also in in political terms? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I suggest we collect the questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I will try to, uh, I will try to express something. It might be uh, understood as a question. Uh, I, I'm not even sure what I am. I'm going to say, but <laughs> I'm not a, an expert uh, uh, not, uh, in Chinese anything. Uh, and actually, it was about three years ago when I, uh, partly for personal reasons, I, I got interested in China. It, it, it happened to be. It turned out to be. Actually, a few days before Corona started, of China, that is a, as from China, so it is a strange coincidence. And then I, I, I really went through some 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 material and read a lot of statements from Xi Jinping, and I went through an analysis from the uh, of the last uh, speech of Xi Jinping on uh, the Congress of the Communist of Communist Party. Uh, uh, written by a, um, a Chinese uh, political philosopher and international lawyer. Uh, sadly, I don't remember his name. But exception, I found it exceptionally in intelligent, very well read. Uh, I mean, it was, as, as I said, an, an interpretation of, uh, of the uh, speech of Xi Jinping and additional remarks. And uh, he emphasized that there is a difference, uh, quite serious difference between uh, Western thinking and Chinese thinking. That is, the, that is the Chinese thinking is basically not dualistic. And the other thing was that he mentioned that China is very, uh, I mean, paying a lot of tribute to Marx, but the class struggle is dropped. Class struggle is no use anymore, but struggle is very much in. And his philosopher uh, quoted Nietzsche, quoted uh, uh, Karl Schmidt, quoted Max Weber, even some ex existentialist philosophers, and 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 said there is the there, there is struggle, as a struggle very emphasized, and in this struggle. In the on the international stage and in the struggle, China will not be the loser. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think it pointed a bit to the fact that it's not that uh, dichotomous Chinese there, Western traditions there, also the Chinese traditions are mixed up and entangled with Western traditions. Okay, uh, oh, oh, yeah, Peter Burl, and then I come over to the side. I try to do justice to both sides. Okay. Thank you very much for the contributions. It's really interesting. I would be interested in uh, stepping a little bit down from the rather abstract uh, level that we have been uh, discussing until now. So we have learned that there is, uh, and I think that's really in, in, important, that there is a grand strategy uh, of China's cultural diplomacy. I would be very much interested in learning a little bit more uh, about uh, uh, the concrete activities of uh, China, of Chinese cultural institutions in Latin America. So I have a, quite an idea of what, for example, Goethe Institute is doing in, in Latin America or what uh, Institut Francaise is doing or other uh, European culture and institutions. So if you could tell us a little bit more about the concrete Chinese activities, this this would be great. I, I'm sure this is in the study. I haven't had the time to 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 read it. I'm I'm gonna do this, but uh, I think this could also be enriching for our discussion uh, this evening. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um could we pass the mic over to the side? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Carsten Warnecke. I'm with the German Federal Foreign Office. I'm dealing with cultural affairs and 
China and Latin America and previously with Africa. Um, I've been dealing with Asia for the past 25 years and with could been confronted with China more and more in the past 10 years and had experiences working with them. Just one comment and two questions. A comment is on this asymmetry, which was mentioned before. China always puts forward, it wants partnerships, it wants um, um, eye to eye level uh, um, uh, cooperation, uh, what they always then like to call also win-win. Uh, my interpretation is what China likes is win-win, you know, the second win in capital letters, and uh, meaning that, yes, you gain from the cooperation, there's something in it for you, this is their selling point, but there's more for us. Um, my questions, one for Latin America, um, you've been, I understand your study is on the multilateral level, and you've said that um, what is missing on the Latin American side in the relation to China is a, a sort of a cohesive stand or in, in some form how to address it. I'd be curious, what is your, um, your, your uh, how do you see, how is it perceived? How is China perceived by the Latin American countries? Um, do, do they open the doors wide? Do, do they welcome it? Or are they skeptical or hesitant? So the perception question there. And the other question is for Ms. Drofi um, concerning Africa. Um, the European former colonial powers have been dealing with cultural diplomacy on that continent for quite some time, for decades, um, including Germany. Um, China is very late in the game. Um, and given also this um, general competition of narratives and so forth, um, should European countries be concerned about China's engagement in Africa? Is there a threat posed to the work that the Europeans are doing there? Or is there something actually that the Chinese are doing better that can be learned from the Chinese? Thank you. Very good question. And I would take one more question from the floor and then... Uh probably pass it or back to the panelists to respond. Hello, Stefan Hopfgarten. Um, I'm a bit with uh, the question, well, my question is also, but what is the, actually the impact um, uh, of the Chinese uh, cultural policy? Um, let's take Ghana. The, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot her name. She, she was mentioned, for instance, the theater in Accra was built by the Chinese. This was already in the 90s, so already maybe it should be renovated again. But at the same time, um, the, the, the big ship trawler are fishing the, the, the fishers in front of the, the coast of Ghana. The local fishermen don't get any fish anymore. Most of the tradition, or a lot of traditional clothes or the um, text, uh, textile are made in China and also take the jobs from the traditional clothes maker. So there's actually a lot of uh, negative impact on the daily life of the of the Ghanaians. At the same time, China tries with some cultural yeah, influence on the elite. But what is the impact on the real people? Are they perceiving China better? Even their life goes more down. Yeah, that's my okay. idea question. Thank you very much. Just uh, we have been looking at the Q and A from the internet audience, but we haven't had any so far. It's not that we uh, discriminated against them. Um, so I would pass on uh, back to the floor and perhaps in the same order of appearance. Jimena, you go first. Yes. So um, to grab, kind of grab up the, the, the questions from the audience. Um, yeah, the the question about the impact and the perceptions of, of, of Latin Americans towards all these, these initiatives, I can only say in this specific level on the like regional level, like how 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 the 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 the, the CELAC uh, as an organization has reacted to 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 the initiatives proposed by uh, by 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 China no so yeah because in my study I didn't do like interviews for instance on the particular participants that 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 went to China on these guided tours or who actually participated in all these initiatives so I cannot like say anything on 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 their behalf but I can say that 
all all these initiatives, all these like at least ten sub forums in the in the in the realm of culture have been well have been well perceived by 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 all the states. Uh, uh, for for instance, in the case of the of the Belt Belt and Road Initiative, uh, there are already like uh, like twenty one like memorandums of understanding that uh, Latin American countries have signed with uh, with China. There was this the, this this declaration uh, of the CELAC as an organization to support this 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 initiative, for instance, and. Uh, this is why we also see that in the cultural realm there is a, a specific sub, sub forum for this uh, so-called dialogue of uh, among civilizations, no, which is well perceived by the China CELAC forum. Uh, different kinds of actors participate participate in this in this uh, in these forums. So I see that at this level there is a good a good uh, perception. Um, yeah, maybe one remark is that yeah, like cultural diplomacy in the end cannot be totally controlled by a state, not even if if it's uh, China uh, and it's uh, a nature of being a, an authoritarian state. It can in the end, uh, it is the, the the last message. Like whether the 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 audience buys or no the message or not the message in the end it's the individual or groups of the civil society who 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 who, who decide this now um then um okay uh, regarding yeah the this like what is going on in the in the ground like what specific uh, cultural uh, initiatives are on the ground uh, well, yes, like uh, like uh, like in Africa, for instance, now in Latin America, at the bilateral level, we have these uh, Conf Confucius uh, institutes. No, uh, in Latin America, there are like 43, 43 Confucius institutes in terms of scholarships, for instance. Uh, in the period of 2010 until 2017, uh, what what we know uh, is that uh, there were at least. Uh, uh, 56,000 Latin American students who went to China to study. I uh, um, then then we have like at least the the, the plans. This, this is this this was the plan of of, of China on you know, providing at least 6,000 scholarships during the period of 2015 until 2019. Another 6,000 scholarships in uh, for the period of 2019 to 2000. 21 and 5,000 scholarships uh, uh, from 2022 and 2024. The actual number, like we, uh, in in the end, like we 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 don't have like a, a concrete number of uh, the scholarships that China has given to 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 Latin American to Latin American students. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jimena. Avril. Uh, some remarks from your side on the comments questions. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for those comments. Um, I just want to start off with this idea of um, just generally that's having on on the country uh, on the countries that that we were looking at that Myra study was looking at. Um, you know, there were two thousand students coming from Africa to China in two thousand three, and by twenty eighteen there were 81,500 students. So the impact has been huge on this idea that China is an exemplar of how you do development. It's, they, it's seen as a developing country. That narrative has been very powerful. However, I think on most other points around its involvement in infrastructure development on the continent, the jury for me is still very much out. I think the criticism is much louder and has a more powerful import than um, African governments are wanting to admit. And even China itself acknowledges that there are criticisms that need to be taken into consideration. So the key question asked of me here is, you know, it's late in the game. Yes, it is coming to cultural diplomacy. Uh, is there anything the West could learn? Well, I'm not sure. I think the West has a lot to learn, but not from China. 
there's a lot to learn from listening to what African countries are saying about, about um, engagement on the continent. I think China also has to learn what African countries are saying from the AU all the way down to non-state actors, civil society, and so on. I've done a lot of research and written about EU's engagement continent, and it's not all wonderful. Uh, there are many problematic plans for lack of trust, um, lack of respect shown to the AU um, on Africa as a single country, as a region, not, not um represented by EU funding, which separate foreign Africa and the MENA region, um, in terms of um, all actors not being able to manage and needing to be in partnership with EU programs around the relationship of the way in which actors are seeing, and I'm talking here about international cultural, it's really general aid. Um, so I think both parties, if I can call them parties, the EU in general, China in general, need to listen much more closely to what African uh, non-state actors and African uh, countries are saying about the ways in which they want to have and show leadership of their own development relationships. And I think the uh, the, the 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 narrative China suggesting that it's coming with a view. I think he's also not necessarily, we are reflecting on it. I'm not necessarily saying it's correct. But, for example, many actors talk about how this has actually screwed up Africa, giving the aid, but not building necessary infrastructure. The government comes in back of that and says, well, we're going to provide Africa with what it needs for its development. Um, and um, local actors saying we don't trust what the Chinese are doing. So these narratives are coming out the criticism remain very strong. And um okay. and, and in Thank the text okay. where um the fishermen in Jamestown, which is part of Ghana Okay, we take that sorry. as a concluding word. <laughs> uh, David, uh, sorry that the connection is getting a bit problematic now. Uh, we've been hearing you very well all, uh, basically all the time, but now it's been cutting out with the Ghanese fishermen. Um, but I think you brought a lot of points across. Um, and we are running out of time. So I would pass the word for to, to Professor Maul for some concise con concluding remarks responses from his side and then dr miller will finish us off thank you very much i just wanted to pick up one point and the gentleman who made that point has left now but still i think it might be worthwhile pointing out he commented on the non-dualist thinking which uh, uh, chinese intellectuals now emphasize often and he also he also found the word struggle a lot, uh, while the word class struggle no longer plays a role. I think this is correct. Uh, but the, the first thing, the sort of the emphasis on non-dualist thinking in China's cultural tradition, to me, is really an interesting example of how the leadership of the Communist Party in recent years has been trying to um, to um, acquire and use Chinese cultural tradition, cultural traditions for its own purposes. So this uh, this uh, bow to non-dualist thinking in the tradition of Chinese philosophy uh, is really quite alien in a way to the thinking of the Communist Party, which continues to be a Marxist-Leninist party. But at the moment, a lot of money is flowing into discovering the Chinese cultural traditions in the past, and acquire it, uh, use it for the purposes of the new narrative of the Chinese re rejuvenation. And you were quite right, struggle is a key word in the narratives of Xi Jinping. And the struggle now, the str he's preparing China for hard times, for difficult times, and it's the struggle against the West. Uh, and ultimately, it's a struggle against the West because there's a fear, a continuing fear at the heart of the leadership of the Communist Party that democratic ideas may 
contaminate China. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Müller, from your side, some responding remarks? I will be very short. Um, there was a question in the chat asking for cooperation between China and uh, Germany in the context of UNESCO. There has be, there had been a very strong cooperation in the context of UNESCO biosphere reserves in the 90s. That has stopped about 20 years ago, but there it continues to be a very strong exchange in the, in the context of uh, tangible and intangible cultural heritage actually supported by Daimler-Benz. I would like to close and say one or two sentences about the impact. I think we can. China can has already gotten a lot of uh, return on investment from the, for, uh, from the cultural diplomacy in, in through UNESCO. Um, through the listings, yes, um, that that provides a lot of visibility of China to the world stage, to tourism, and usually the what, what China gets back from that is, is it's, it's enormous amounts of of of, uh, of income from tourism. For example, UNESCO Global Geoparks is a program where where, where China financially um, benefits a lot. Um, what I think is most interesting, and I have shortly elaborated on that before is that China is experimenting a lot with influencing norm setting, international instruments, uh, international standard setting, trying, and Professor Maul has said that as well, trying to bring Chinese language into um, texts of international law, for example, living in harmony and other uh, typical um, Chinese expressions. So far, it has not been overly successful in that regard. But I, my personal obs observation is that uh, China is getting very fast, very uh, acquires a lot of excellence in, in doing these things and is currently really, for example, in the context of artificial intelligence, really moving the goalposts on what it can achieve also through its cultural policy making in terms of influencing international law, uh, law. And that is an impact. That's a strong impact, I would say. Thank you very much. I think it, uh, thank you also for picking up on the question in the online from the online audience. And um, I think that has uh, kind of once again shown how broad it is when we speak of cultural diplomacy that goes from language uh, through theater, through the arts, uh, all the way to artificial intelligence. So um, in that sense, I think uh, this has shown how much there still is to be done because actually um, there's so much more attention on the rise of China in many, many ways, but we have much less attention to this, I think, very important sphere, which spans all the way from the cultural sphere, language sphere, scientific sphere. Um, without much further ado, I would, before cl I close, thank very much the authors of the two studies. They really have provided a tremendous work and a tremendous uh, field for further uh, digging into and reading it. I want to, of course, thank the funding that made that possible uh, via the Institute for Auslandsbeziehung and also for uh, jointly organizing this outreach event we have been having here. I want to thank the uh, Iberoamerikanische Institute and Peter Böhle for hosting this event in this very fine location here. I want to thank the uh, technical uh, team who has struggled to make the, the best, uh, even with the bandwidth problems we had with Ever, I think you've done a great job. I think it went very well. And I want to thank, of course, the panelists and the audience for this lively interaction participation. I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, have a very nice evening and all the best. And please, the final word is on the advertisement for the studies here in the room. We have, when you leave the door, the QR code where you can get easily to the download. And I think if I'm not mistaken, we can put on the QR code now also here so you can scan it and get right to the uh, publications. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks a lot for being with us and have a good evening. <laughs>